Welcome back, Sega fans. It's the Sega guys once again with me, Dan the Mega Driver, and James the Sega Holic. And we're going back, back in time, back into the archives. And what special treat do we have for our viewers this time, James? Yes, mate. Um, after the roaring success that was the Saturn Years Year Zero, which is still going great guns, approaching almost 400 views, um, taken off beyond what we really expect it to and we, we think it's going to be one of these series it's going to be a bit of a, a slow burner these kind of retrospective historical kind of podcasts do tend to to kind of gather momentum over time so we thought after the success of year zero and with the planning and progress for year two we thought let's get year one out there so yeah this is the re-edit of the saturn years year one and um what a job, mate. The job you did on, on Year Zero was outstanding. Um, and I'm sure listeners and viewers, well, viewers this time especially, are going to love what you've done with Year One. Thank you very much, mate. Yes, I uh, hope our viewers do enjoy this. It's uh, something that, again, very, very proud of. We've got Year Zero, it's already online. This is Year One, and we've got the launch games, which ties into the series as we move towards Year Two. But we're going back in time, not too far back. This was only a uh, eight months ago this was for season three when we, when we returned to youtube so <laughs> yeah yep. going back in time but not too far but shall we do the old uh wayne's world Why not? <laughs> the year is 1995 sega are coming off perhaps their most successful year ever in 1994 the Mega Drive was going strength to strength. It outsold the SNES again in the US and Europe for the third year in a row. There were not one, but two major Sonic games. You could say that there were probably just one game, it being Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles. But Sega was supporting the, the Master System, in Europe at least, where they had six Sega-produced games there. The Game Gear, the Mega CD was supported. The Sega Saturn, as we covered last episode, in 1994 was a massive success in Japan, selling half a million consoles in the lead up to Christmas in, in the space of just over a month, which is absolutely astonishing for it to be that much of a success. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, the 32X has launched with its own first party content, and that launched pretty damn well in the US, selling <laughs> around 300,000 units. So that's six systems all live in one year for Sega, who at that point <laughs> had so much market share that they didn't know what to do with it. I mean, that's that's insane, isn't it, mate? <laughs> yeah, I mean, part of it is obviously, retrospectively, a lot of what kind of led to the downfall. Um, Sega always trying to be first, always trying to do new things. Um, and obviously, you know, having those, you know, six systems on the go, you know, across the world, just a, a crazy, crazy thing to think about whenever you look at the way, obviously, generations have gone since you know everybody's had like one console now we're into this kind of norm where you get like a mid-cycle refresh you know you'd ps4 pro you'd xbox one x and there's there's every chance that you know some point down the line there'll be refreshes of you know the current xbox and, and playstation as well but you know these were all very different systems they were all generational systems you know a handheld in there as well just absolutely crazy to think that they were trying to support six systems but as you said, you know, the, the, the 32X launched in the US, um, you know, over Christmas 94, 300,000 units. And by early 1995, they'd sold 600,000 of them, you know. But as we'll discuss, the caveat of the 32X's success in the US, as compared to obviously in Japan, that didn't kind of do that well at all, um, is that the Saturn was obviously pending. Its surprise launch was, was upcoming, obviously coming to, to E3, uh, in, in the 1995 um, inaugural E3. Um, but the fact that, you know, the 32X and the Saturn both shared the same, you know, pretty much a lot of the same architecture and then the SH2 Hitachi chips, um, essentially and ironically, the, the 32X was more or less um, taking stock away from Saturn, um, which is we'll go into later on as we get to that kind of launches. That it was essentially, you know, taken away processors which sega needed to build a new flagship console but they were getting to this you know sort of mid not even a, a kind of not even a mid mid cycle just a very strange late in the generation for the mega drive add-on that really wasn't needed 
Yeah, absolutely. And as I said in the last episode for uh, for Year Zero, I actually really wanted a 32X. It really appealed to me as you know an affordable add-on. But when you look at what Sega was supporting back then, six consoles, it, it, they just couldn't maintain it. They certainly couldn't support yet another console which was occupying the same 32-bit space as, as what, their, what their flagship would be. But, you know, it's, it's different in priorities. In Japan, the flagship immediately was the Saturn. And uh, in the US, the Genesis was still, you know, their, their, their pride and joy. And that's why, that's why they, I suppose, one of the many, many reasons why they clash so much. And it's quite interesting to think that in, in Japan, the 32X was a complete non-event. It was, it was ignored completely. It was, it was dead on arrival. So it had no effect on the Saturn performance whatsoever because no one actually paid it any mind. It wasn't promoted. I think if it, I've looked at 32X games in Japan to buy Japanese copies and they go for a ridiculous amount of money because no one bought them. No one bought the album. <laughs> no one bought the games. It was a complete, you know, non-event. It, so there was no issue with consumer confidence in Japan. It wasn't a case of people saw oh, they they've launched this new console and abandoned it. I've got no faith in the Saturn. They didn't care because the 32X was just kind of shuffled in meekly and then shuffled out again, kicked out, given the shepherd's crook, pulled off the stage before it could even get going. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in Japan, by the time the, 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 the 32X has been and gone, the, the Sega Saturn is already a massive, massive hit. So in, in the US, though, it was a completely different story. The 32X came out and it was the headline unit, at least for one Christmas, uh, and did fairly well, uh, only to have the, the rug swept out on it under, from underneath it. And that really didn't do it any favours in the eyes of the consumer. No, I mean, obviously the, the kind of story is well known, but um, it is interesting that the Japanese just completely shunned it. You know, they were clearly looking forward to the flagship console far more. Um, but it is kind of obviously, you know, intriguing to see how well it did do in the US. Uh, I know whenever we, we spoke to Tom, and he's obviously on the record saying this as well, I think it was Classic Gaming Quarterly, um, and his, one of his um, Saturn launch review videos that he's done which is brilliant and um, one of the quotes from Tom Kalinske on there is that you know his opinion they should have stuck with Genesis for another year you know they didn't he didn't even see the need for for Saturn to even to come out they were quite happy to to sit with with Genesis for another year um, and obviously we've seen you know the stuff in Edge magazine as well that was issue seven you know which was what was that April 94 um, it was April 94, uh, issue 7 of Edge, where the original plan, you know, was for the Jupiter in the Saturn, where the idea was that they would release, you know, essentially they're going down the Series S and X sort of skew idea, where the, the Jupiter would be cartridge-based, it would have less RAM, but it would still share the same CPU architecture as the Saturn, um, and it would be considerably cheaper, maybe $200 cheaper. Um, and obviously it was aimed at having an entry level next generation system alongside the Saturn so they were meant to launch together apparently from what the, the report says um, but that never came to fruition and we got the 32X instead um, as that add on for the for the Mega Drive so uh, it's it's interesting in that the kind of narrative is that the 32X was you know harmful and it destroyed consumer confidence and perhaps it did obviously because it was dropped so quickly but the American uptake on it as we've seen from the sales numbers, you know, for one Christmas, it was it was doing great numbers. So Sega's probably looking at it, you know, Tom and Al are sitting there probably looking at the figures going, oh, yes, he's doing really well, you know, surpassing expectations. But as in Japan, they're going, no, just give us a Saturn, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting because obviously we talked about the fact that they were looking at Project Mars back in the, the previous Year Zero episode. So they always, it always seemed that they wanted to make two consoles as ever, however ill-advised it may have been. But, you know, as you say, it's, it's worked wonders for Xbox at the moment. So uh, it's... It's odd how to wonder how like a less powerful Saturn would have would have fared if it was a standalone unit with, that was cartridge based. But I suppose it's it's one of those what if scenarios. But the thirty two X kind of it kind of almost is that very much that very scenario um, because it shared so much architecture with the Saturn. Not not least the two SH two processors. Um, the problem was you've got the the thirty two X selling six hundred thousand uh, units in early nineteen ninety five in the US alone, which in a in such a short time space of time, that's, that's quite a lot of, of hardware to shift. But the problem with it all is that same processor 
is taking processes away from Sega Sound production. Production for the 32X was problematic. Uh, Scott Bayliss of Sega America confirmed in an interview because sat needed resources and that was taking resources away from the 32x and vice versa when you're trying to manufacture satins uh they couldn't manufacture as many satins as they could because the 32x needed those resources so uh it's just the two consoles sega's just competing with themselves cannibalizing each other's market which uh is pretty bonkers when you when you think about it yeah uh, it's again one of those kind of baffling business decisions isn't it that you know, you're, you're trying to kind of put a new flagship console out there, um, but because you've obviously made this add-on to try and expand the life of your outgoing generation, which is still selling well, obviously, in, in the West, you know, especially the kind of European and US regions, but um, at the same time, you're using that similar architecture, so you're literally, you know, 600,000 units, that's potentially 600,000 Saturns that weren't made, because obviously yeah. that they're making this, you know, the, the 32X, and obviously... You know, we know about the kind of surprise launch, which we are going to talk about. Um, and the fact that while the slogan for the Saturn, you know, Tom stood up on stage and said, you know, Sega Saturn, it's out there. Um, it pretty much wasn't because, you know, there wasn't enough stock. You know, they talk about the surprise launch and the fact that you know, certain retailers were left out. Um, KB Toys, the now notorious one who dropped Sega altogether because they were left out. Um, but it seems that, they were more or less probably left out, not by some kind of malicious choice by Sega to go, you can have it, you can have it, you can. It was more or less, I think it's more historically looking at it now, is because they simply didn't have the units to go around. You know, I think KB Toys, the amount of chains that they had around the country at that time, they're one of the kind of biggest retailers in the States. So there's no way Sega could obviously filter out the limited number of stock they had to enough retailers, including them. So they've just probably went, they're too big. We can't give them to all their stores, so we'll just leave them out. But you've just got to think, if they weren't making the 32X with that shared architecture, 600,000 extra Saturns at launch, you yeah. know, they could have been out there in a lot more, no pun intended, they could have been out there as the, the slogan goes, but <laughs> it very much wasn't. And it's all down to the fact that that shared architecture, it's a crazy that nobody kind of looked at it and went, mm, do you know, I think we should maybe stop, you know, we just shouldn't have made the thing altogether, let's be honest. I mean, yeah. you know, it's just one of those kind of mind-boggling things that, well, it did do well initially, that initial Christmas it was out, it did do well and it was well received. It did have some great games on the, you know, Virtua Race and Star Wars Arcade, even the Port of Virtua Fighter, which some argue is better than the Saturn version. Um, I don't but some people do prefer the 32X version of Virtua Fighter. So it had some great games, but retrospectively looking at it, it did take away a lot of stock from the Saturn and what is a baffling decision. Yeah, absolutely a baffling decision because not only did it take away, did it impact production of the Sega Saturn and take up resources, but also it harmed consumer confidence. Um, and it's mad to think that they launched that for Christmas 1994 have a pretty good launch with it uh, and then start hyping it up and then kind of drop it because the Saturn was a success in Japan and that's the biggest thing about it. It was so successful that uh, Nakamura was, you know, so eager to get it in into the hands of, of US Sega fans. Uh, and not only was he eager to replicate the success of the Saturn in Japan over in the US, but there was this this innate fear of the PlayStation 1 or the Sony PlayStation as it was then, because that was growing so hotly anticipated. We touched on in the previous episode just how much people were kind of getting impressed behind closed doors and at, at consumer electronic shows and everything. So Nakayama was pressuring Tom Kalinske to, to launch the Saturn early. So that's why we had the surprise launch. But uh, it's quite interesting because the surprise launch wasn't last minute. It was planned or rumoured months in advance. I think there was a rumour in Edge magazine all the way back in maybe January or February that, um, that yeah, it was going to la launch early despite Sega sticking to the Saturn Day uh, tagline of, of early September initially. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we've, we've touched on that in previous shows as well, that, you know, it would have been probably more advisable for Sega to, to maybe delay three months rather than come forward three months. But again, you know, Nakayama, obviously buoyed by the success of the Saturn, worried about, you know, the pending hype of the PlayStation, has jumped the gun, you know, and, and literally told, you know, Tom Kalinske that he's got to, 
you know, stand on stage and, and announce the that the Saturn has been eminently available as in after the show at certain retailers. But um I just maybe a wee bit of arrogance there on the part of Nakayama that he maybe took the success in Japan for granted. Um maybe thought that the attitudes and, you know, what gamers would expect in the West mirrored what was happening in Japan because obviously the the rush of the launch over here and in the States harmed a lot of kind of developer kind of confidence as well because obviously all these developers are all working towards the September Saturn day launch and all of a sudden they've had three months taken away from them to have their games you know touched up finalized packaged gone gold out to retailers so there was certain developers who completely lost that very important and much you know sought after launch window where you know you could release a game that's maybe not the best not not saying like a crap game or but maybe a game that's that's nowhere near what you would you know expect a system a new system to put out but we've all bought games at launch because you, you look at a launch and you go right i'll take xyz but there's maybe like a a wee kind of wild card in there that usually you wouldn't look at but the kind of hype of the launch and you've got a wee bit of extra cash in your wallet and you go you know what i'll pick up something else and there was developers who lost you know that kind of that opportunity and it pissed them off a wee bit um so you know maybe you know nakiyama didn't quite appreciate that western gamers were looking for something a bit different that developers weren't quite ready to launch and while you and i adore virtue fighter you know that the first game to this day we still love it um attitudes in the west towards arcades were shifting um gamers over here were looking for more more content a street arcade port was starting to kind of again you and i loved it we are sega gamers we love the arcade we frequented them you know as as, as teenagers and we loved seeing those arcade ports come home but western gamers were starting to look for a little bit more from their games a bit more content and i think maybe nakayama putting that kind of early launch on tom um there's so many several aspects of it as i say developers getting annoyed at having a launch window taken from them certain ones having to be rushed through um and also the consumer confidence from the 32x just kind of combined to make the Saturn launch an absolute non-event. This didn't have the effect at all that I think Nakayama expected it to. Um, and aye, it is what it is. It's history, as they say. Yeah, as you say, mate, it was, uh, it was a bit of a, a mess, really, because, as you rightly say, they, they messed the developers around. They were meant to have 20 games ready for the launch in September. They only had six first-party uh, first games ready, uh, so a lot less... Uh, obviously, they were all made by Sega because no one else was ready. They did seem, you know, poorly prepared. So, as you already said, KB Toys pulled out, which was the biggest, the biggest uh, hit, especially after Tom Kalinske spent so much of the Mega Drive or Genesis era trying to bring retailers on side from this Nintendo-dominated landscape. So it was, it was a shame, really, and to really rub salt into the wound, into the wound. <laughs> E3, 1995. Steve Race gets up on the podium and and mentions uh, those those free figures. Uh, Two ninety nine, yeah, <laughs> which which Tom described as an uh, an oh shit moment when we were talking to him. Ah, uh, that's right. Uh, that's, how, that's his exact words when we spoke to us. An oh shit moment. But I mean, see that that kind of always annoyed me, right? Because obviously, you know, if you walked into a store. Your two nine nine PlayStation, you couldn't take it home unless you spent an extra eighty quid more. You got an expensive CD player then with a controller. <laughs> yep, you had to buy a game and you had to buy a memory card. You know, so yeah, while as an impact moment, the two ninety nine thing certainly was, um, you know, it, it done its job. You know, straight away, consumers are like that. We're all like that. Um, you know, especially in this day and age with the kind of cost of living crisis and stuff like that. Anything that just you know, looks cheaper will obviously always be more attractive. But, you know, as you dig down into it, Saturn came with Virtua Fighter bundled. It had built-in storage to save your games. So, yeah, you were paying three nine nine, but you were getting, you walked out the, the store with that box with a Saturn on it. You had everything you needed to go home and play and save your game. PlayStation, if you paid two nine nine, as you said, mate, you've got a CD player with a controller. So, again, Sony, very clever at what they did. Um... 
I know people say it's like the shortest press conference ever, but there actually was more to that. I, think, I can't mean I've seen a video online and someone said that there actually was a full conference. Mm-hmm. I think as, as time has passed, people think like Sony's whole E three ninety five was just two ninety nine, <laughs> but there there was an actual an actual E three conference that they did, and um, that was just as Tom said the big kind of oh shit moment. Yeah, it it was, and you're absolutely right, mate. Um, the the PlayStation at two ninety nine was just a bare bone system of the Saturn. You didn't. Re- it was still worked out more to have the Saturn because it's about twenty five dollars more. But that two ninety nine just looks more attractive, doesn't it? And it was just like so much of the Saturn versus PlayStation era. It was a publicity thing, a marketing thing, really more than anything else that uh, that Sony were masterful at. And uh, Steve, obviously knowing Tom and and the gang from back in the Genesis days, uh, Steve being you know, part of the team that really projected the uh, the genesis into the stratosphere. Um, he knew what he was up against, and uh, yeah, I think he knew exactly what he was doing there. So it's a just one of those ill-advised things that the the Saturn launch. Uh, a shame because the games still only trickled out after that, um, mainly due to the fact that they were just they just the games just weren't ready. They were all aiming for that that September that September deadline, and as a uh, as you know, we saw in some uh, some information that's out there, the Saturn, even though it was out there, it, it took, you know, beyond the actual projected launch day for it to finally get around all of the United States, you know, well, well into September by the time it made its way around. So it's a, it's a shame that uh, that they didn't wait because I think it might have been in a, in a better place had they done so. Yeah, just everything would have been more prepared. Developers would have had their games ready. There'd been more inventory to put out to more retailers. They wouldn't have damaged those relationships. As you said, you know, we've all seen console wars. We spoke to Blake J. Harris. We've read the book. You know, Nintendo dominated that landscape. They were very, very, you know, they would punish retailers if their Nintendo space wasn't big enough or they weren't given enough kind of, you know, shelf space to, to Nintendo games. And you know, Tom's came in and Al's came in and, and they've done a great job at, you know, managing to kind of get retailers to, to shun those kind of Nintendo attitudes um, and give more shelf space to Sega. You know, Sega going round the US retailers on like a tour, parking, you know, tour buses outside, loading them up with Mega Drives and letting people play them, you know, things like that that they did to obviously bring retailers on board in, in one fell swoop, one decision that was made literally just destroyed all that goodwill overnight so i uh, just baffling baffling decisions baffling indeed mate another thing that uh, was very interesting to me is the fact that same v3 that same very e3 uh, sega were getting a little bit of pressure because people had seen things like to uh, and they'd seen tekken the very first tekken with texture max characters and Sega were drilling up a response, and that response was Virtual Fighter Remix. It was shown behind closed doors. Only a few people got to see it, and the people that saw Virtual Fighter Remix were extremely impressed. And Sega were flood inundated, apparently, with requests: "Is is this a real game? When's a Virtual Fighter Remix coming out?" And Sega kept saying, "No, it's just a tech demo. It's not coming out at all." Uh, lo and behold, in Japan, where the Sega Saturn has reached 1 million sales you know and this is in just over six months uh to celebrate that it's discounted and bundled with another game and what game is that it's bundled with virtua fighter remix <laughs> which again uh baffling decisions or maybe a complete lack of communication there as to what was happening yeah i mean this was in um pandemonium's um virtua fighter remix video that he's done he's done a, a video i think it's about 30 or 40 minutes long and um, the vf remix one but um, it was him that was obviously saying that, you know, there's actually a part with footage which he's, he's asked if he could try and get of VF Remix being played behind the scenes at E3. So there's no real reason why, in his opinion, and a lot of people's opinion, why Remix couldn't have been a launch title. Um, it was shown, it was f- completed, people were playing it, um, and obviously they've decided you know, that we're just going to go with the the standard edition. Obviously, if, if they've had that press to gold and had it all retail packaged and put in the boxes and it's all about to stores, it was possibly too late. But then how long ago was, was Remix done? You know, um, and again, in Pandemonium's video, he does say that there was people phoning up Sega's, you know, hotlines and 
you know, asking about it, you know, oh, I've heard you've got this new version of Virtua Fighter called Virtua Fighter Remix and it's got texture and maps characters. Is are you going to release it? And Sega spokespeople were literally saying, No, it's just as you said, a tech demo. Um it's just preparation for like, you know, maybe Virtua Fighter 2's development, we're not going to release it. And then, as you say, to celebrate a million sales in Japan, discounted as a game for you via Remix. Um and obviously over here um, we got it as a kind of a freebie if you registered your Saturn before, I think it was either September or October. Um, you, I think I'm sure it was September, end of September. Um, you were given it for free. Um, and again, this is something I remember because Monkle, he was always one, he, Monkle registered his everything, whether he bought a record player, a Walkman, a CD player, should shouldn't get back in time. You're talking about tech. No, it's no, it's no MP3 players and Blu-rays. It's you know a, a VHS machine, a separate hi-fi deck, and a games console. He always sent away his registration card. It was the first thing he would always do, um, and obviously did it for the Saturn. And he he was totally unaware that he was going to receive this. This just popped through the door, and I remember I went up to visit one day, and he handed me it, and it was the the really nice big cardboard box that you opened up the flap and then there was a, a lovely kind of double dual CD case sitting on the inside and you had obviously a VF remix on one side and you had the CG portrait disc on the other. Um, just a lovely, lovely package that Sega put together for it, especially in Europe. It was really nice um, and you and I were talking about that and apparently it goes for stupid money now, um, which doesn't surprise me. But um, yeah, a nice touch by Sega to, to kind of put that out there. But at the same time, them doing that has pushed this narrative that Sega with Remix was a response to the criticism of Virtua Fighter 1 in the face of Toshinden and Tekken. But if you go back and look at reviews such as Edge, who reviewed the, the Japanese copy of Virtua Fighter, they gave it a 9 out of 10. They called it the first true next generation game. So People again, 2022, talk about, oh, Virtua Fighter 1 was lambasted, it was criticised, you know, and aye, it did a flickering, you know, polygons from certain views and parts of the arena flickered in and out, um, and those were all fixed with Remix. It was a much more polished game. Um, but part of me doesn't really believe that Sega were stung by criticism of Virtua Fighter and then, you know, rushed out Remix to kind of counter that. I don't think Sega were that worried about to Shinden and, and Tekken in that regard. I think the fact that Virtua Fighter was selling one for one with systems. It was the biggest arcade game in Japan. So, you know, in what world would Sega look at to Shinden and Tekken and look at their game and think, you know, oh, we need to be worried here. We need to rejig our game. This Virtua Fighter was a phenom in Japan, you know, one for one system seller bundled with the, the Western consoles. Sega were very, very confident in the success of Virtua Fighter. So I don't think that this narrative that Sega went, oh my God, Toshinden looks amazing. We need to make a new game. I don't buy that at all. Um, I just, I do think there was an aspect of it that they were leaning towards developing texture mapped fighting games. Um, and they were looking at Virtua Fighter 2, which was coming out in the arcade, and they were also looking at the Saturn port for that. I think VF Remix is very much a test bed for Virtua Fighter 2, as opposed to being an immediate reaction to to to, to Sunjin and, and Tekken. Yeah, I think it's probably somewhat of a of a tech demo to show that it can do tech yeah. maps. Yeah, um, I think it was it's it's kind of all of those things. It's it's to show that the the Saturn could do texture maps in a fighting game. You know, at a fluid frame rate, or it, it was thirty frames per second still, but because it was built in the old Virtual Fire engine. But at the same time, I know we wanted to weren't going to go into the games themselves, but I think on this one it's probably very important that we do because it was so important to the lineup. But yeah, I think the, the first game. Our first iteration, the pack in did extremely well. Uh, they started, must have started working on remix immediately after completing, you know, the first game. By that point, you know, Toshinden's not even out; no one's even seen it. So, I think that they just started working it as a proof of concept, as a tech demo. Uh, I think the baffling thing about all of this, though, is if you've got Virtua Fighter Remix being bundled in Japan, being bundled with it as far, as soon as as July. And it was out in the US uh, not that much later. And in both the US and, and the UK, it was it was uh, being given away for free. As you just said, you know, your uncle received a copy. 
what was the thought process behind that? Why didn't they just, you know, if they just waited a little longer, waited for the proper launch of the Sega Saturn in in, in September, and they could have, you know, they could have put both versions on, on one disc. Put one disc. You choose before if you want the you know, classic version of Virtual Fire with the flat shaded polygons, or you you decide you want the uh, the the brand new. Uh, texture map version in Virtual Fire Remix. I think that would have been better received um, and looked on more fondly if they'd done it that way and probably would have made, might have bought a few more customers. We, we will never know, but uh, it probably hindsight's twenty twenty. But in, to me, that made, it would have made more sense. Well, I think even if, if they didn't have the, the kind of ability, you know, hardware-wise to, you know, switch between or choose which version you wanted, well, rather than bundling Remix with a CG portrait disc, you could have had a double disc edition with both games in one package, you know, rather than having, you know, the, the portrait disc in there. And again, it all goes back to that. If you're launching with VF, with VF Remix, with Sega Rally, with Virtua Cop, you know, your VF2 coming early in, in 1996, you know, there's, it made more sense. And again, it's okay I was sitting here retrospectively, you know, me sitting in my kitchen recording a podcast talking about Sega, trying to tell, you know, you know, CEOs of a multi-billion dollar corporation, how they should do their business. But, you know, it's, it's baffling that they made the decision to come forward whenever you see the quality of the software that came later on, you know, and the damage that was done via, you know, the, the kind of public perception, media perception, especially again in the UK, PlayStation had a foothold, media was in a frenzy over PlayStation in the UK, um, and any perceived weakness or inferiority in the Saturn was certainly leapt on, um, and obviously, you know, the fact that, you know, Tushinden, which is not a, a great game in my opinion, the first the first Tekken was okay, but again, you look at it, it's that whole thing with, with Ridge Racer and Daytona, and don't want to go into the games again too much, but, you know, the PlayStation was porting arcade games from architecture, which was closely based to it, very similar to Naomi and Dreamcast. Whereas the Saturn was trying to ape Model 1 and Model 2 games. You know, it was trying to go ape these, you know, machines that are costing, you know, tens of thousands of pounds, as opposed to, you know, the, the PlayStation, which was obviously the, the Namco, was it the System 11 board that was based around the, the PlayStation itself? But it was easier to port those games over. So again, a slightly unfair kind of comparison there. But yeah, it's one of these things we'll never know. You know, as you said, hindsight's twenty twenty, mate. But looking at it, you would think, how can Nakayama not see what's coming down the line quality wise and think, you know, we've got faith in our software. Let's get the really good stuff out there at launch and blow them away as opposed to going, no, we need to go out there early. We, we need to kind of take that Japanese launch hype and translate it to the West. And people are going to just jump on it because they love it over here and it just didn't translate like that at all. Yeah, uh, absolutely, mate. It's uh, a miscalculation, I think, on uh, Nakayama's part. I think um, if, I think history's always shown us that uh, that what works in Japan doesn't always work in the US and vice versa. I mean, no, nowhere was that more evident than the fact that the Genesis was so successful in the West and uh, was a failure in Japan and, <laughs> and was a failure was a failure in the West and a success in Japan. But uh, you know, we've talked about the US, the US launch and the the infamous E3 and the early launch there. We've talked about Japan's update. They've reached one million Sega Saturn sales. It's, this console is absolutely flying there. What about us over here? What about the PAL Saturn? So that launch is 8th of July on a Saturday. So that's the, the original Saturn day there. Uh, four launch games. Uh, and in the UK, it sold out. Uh, but that sellout was 5,000 consoles going up to 10,000 in a week. And in the whole of Europe, just 30,000 were sold. Again, hardware shortages to blame there. So that's quite good, the numbers you've shown there, mate, as well, because obviously one of those 5,000 at launch is the one I've got sitting upstairs, which is the one that uh, my uncle got from uh, Comet and Partick. Um, you know, and again, I don't, I don't know how we heard about it because obviously, as I say, I visited the arcades with them, um, but I was very much into the Amiga ecosystem at that point. I was ecosystem, got to the bars to buy pirated games and got to my mates with X copy and I'm calling it an ecosystem. Um, but you know, it's I was very much focused on that 
that kind of machine. Um, and I've written about it for our blog, and people know the story about me going up to, to his that day and, and being surprised by Virtua Fighter running. But um, it's crazy to think that, again, you would think a, a console with only 5,000 units available at launch, and it was easy enough for Monko to just walk into Comet and Partick and pick one up. You know, you think to the way things are now, you know, it's like you still can't walk into a shop and buy a PS5. You know, and again, 5,000 units at launch, um, absolutely crazy. And again, that kind of SH2 shortage, the fact that Saturn's now rolled out worldwide, an early launch, um, it's crazy to think, you know, 30k total, you know, sold at launch in, in Europe. You know, not, in the UK was only at 10k in a week, but in Europe, 30,000 sold. Uh, and again, just crazy to think that they were hindering themselves. But at the same time, one of the kind of good things that they did do um, is that obviously they marketed it as a premium device. Um, one of the kind of first machines to, to bundle a full RGB SCART with the system as opposed to the, the horrible old RF aerial kind of connector that we were all so used to with the reflex switch TV or aerial um, or TV or game, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, and it was, it was great, you know, obviously, you know, being able to hook it up to a SCART TV and get that, you know, pristine picture quality right out of the box was absolutely brilliant. Again, you're talking about the price difference. PlayStation 1 didn't come with a, a SCART cable. It came with standards, you know, AV cables. So, again, you were getting that kind of premium experience um, out of the box. Everything that you needed with the Saturn. Um, but, I crazy, crazy small numbers. And, again, that somebody could just walk in off the street and get one when you've only, you've only got 5,000 units <laughs> at launch. Madness. Yeah. The thing was, there was no, there was no internet. You know your your news with your magazines so the fact that there is these kind of surprise launches that are brought in so early you don't really have chance to to pick them up i used to pick up cvg and mean machine sega and uh, sega saturn magazine there was nary a whisper in there i just remember one day going into and if this was in the summer i was going into the i think it was an electronic boutique actually uh, before it became a game in watford walking in there and there it was sega saturn <laughs> <laughs> being displayed hell. and on on sale and obviously i had no idea and this is me as a as an avid sega fan who's picking up magazines is thinking that he's got the ear to the ground but it's obviously we're in the age of print media it doesn't pick up everything and yeah the sega fan it's out there but uh yeah I, only if you know about it so <laughs> how, how was how was the majority of people to know but um yeah, it's a good point on the on the scar adapter mate it was uh it was a premium device a little bit a little too premium for me <laughs> when i got mine even <laughs> in 1996 because i didn't have a scar telly uh, I, I had to go out and spend another 20 quid on an on an rf adapter so i think that's kind of swings and roundabouts because when I plugged the Scar adapter in while I was waiting for my RF cable uh, on my downstairs tally, as I've said many times, it just absolutely blew me away and felt like the biggest next gen jump I'd ever seen. Um, but also, I couldn't play it in my bedroom as intended because I didn't have the cable. So I think it's a, it was kind of a double edged sword. <laughs> Aye, so you're, you're, you're sitting there going, I've got this premium cable that I can't use, and you had to ask permission to go and hook it up to the, the, the big telly downstairs. Yeah. Um, aye. It was a great excuse. Ah, well, you know, but <laughs> even the Saturn as a, as a system, the Mark I as a system, is very, very premium looking. Oh, yeah. I mean, even today, that kind of lovely matte black, the clean lines, the, the gloss black kind of glass effect front with the power and access lights hidden underneath the glass. You turn it off, you can't even see them. They shine through. You know, just a very, very premium device. The only thing I think's bizarre was the change of controller design, you know, that they moved away from what was the the Mark II controller here, which was the Mark I controller in Japan. Um, the... The PAL controller here, obviously, I didn't know anything about the Mark II controller or the Mark I controller in Japan because I didn't have any of the ground in terms of imports at that time. So whenever I got that that kind of Saturn control pad for the first time on the 8th of July, it was like, wow, I'm used to using a zip stick and I've got this amazing multi-button curved glossy controller in front of me. Um, but I, it's just kind of weird that they decided again, why why would you change that, that controller? Did they feel they had to move away from the... Was it too similar to the six button pad in the Mega Drive? They wanted to kind of make sure that it was totally separate. But the D pad on that is not great. 
um, whenever you compare it to the the Mark II or the, the Japanese Mark One. No, it really was a very, very odd decision. Um, just made it extra chunky. Uh, the shoulder buttons were were definitely worse. Yeah, the D pad was definitely worse. It was, it was such an odd decision. And we talked talked about this in Year Zero when we were talking about the Japanese launch and how well that was received because they loved the UI, which obviously the UI carried over. That didn't change apart from the boot sequence. But to change the controller that was so well received over there is just another another strange decision. Uh, I don't know who would have picked up that that Japanese controller and said, you know what, I don't think this is going to work for Western audiences. We need to make a chunkier controller. It's almost like it's almost like the guy who made the Duke controller for the original Xbox uh, was behind it. Um, it's it's that it's that odd of a decision, really. Um, oh me, I love the Duke. Well, I love the Duke. I mean, I adore the Duke. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> I, I got, that... I got big hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we're both a pair of units, aren't we? So I <laughs> uh, pretty much me pair of pair of bouncers. <laughs> exactly. A pair of bouncers holding a Duke in one hand and a satin Mark One pad from the West in another. <laughs> but yeah, it was an odd decision. Uh, I think the Scott Scott adapter. I think there was a it was probably. A, it's. I think that's an example of Sega being ahead of the curve, thinking too far. We've got all these examples of Sega being too far ahead of the curve, thinking three steps ahead of everyone, and that you know. And I think that was a case of them thinking that far ahead. Whereas you know, it wasn't until the following generation that all consoles would really come with Scott adapters and phono leads. But uh, you know, very very prescient um, approach there but the pad again yeah really really puzzling yeah i just a, a strange strange decision i don't know who picked up that controller and thought ah, i think we need to change this because it's absolutely <laughs> it's perfect it's still my favorite controller to this day is the the mark ii pal japanese mark one controller absolutely brilliant we were just talking about the sega saturn launches in the us in the uk it's now out in the west it's sold out, albeit stock is very hard to come by, uh, and all seems to be going fairly well. I mean, it's a massive hit in Japan. Um, that sellout was pretty encouraging, uh, and then the PlayStation came along in September, <laughs> and it all changed. Yes, I like uh, an over overnight shift, as we kind of alluded to before the the wee interlude there for the the brilliant um, Panzer Dragoon soundtrack. Um, the UK was pretty much a a very strong PlayStation kind of region. Um I think the fact that Sony targeted the kind of clubs and the kind of the, the demographic they went after was very different to Sega. I don't think Sega were although we have touched upon the fact that the Genesis in America did kind of push gaming towards more of a lifestyle kind of accessory as opposed to a gaming console. They had the celebrity endorsements and things like that, the kind of sports titles aiming for an older demographic. I think in, in the UK, I do vividly remember Sony targeting the kind of nightclubs with Wipeout and that kind of soundtrack they had on there, the licensed soundtrack. They were using kind of big club hits at the time. Um, the gaming media um, was very much on the hype train for the PlayStation with I've put the clips up on, on my Twitter from Bad Influence and from Games Master. Um, and Games Master, to be fair, were far kinder to the Saturn. They did review the Big 3 very well. They did a lot of kind of trips to, to Sega of Japan to, to preview those games. But, you know, Bad Influence was very much, you know, you could see the leaning towards PlayStation, the kind of misinformation on the Saturn. You know, Andy Crane saying that the, you know, the Saturn played games from disc and cartridge and things like that. Um, they, they had both consoles in whenever they came out in Japan um, and they closed out the show with Ridge Racer, Virtua Fighter got a very fleeting mention. So you could start to see that whether it was to do with the fact that, you know, Sony as an electronics brand were very strong, you know, obviously their TV, v, VCRs, you know, hi-fis, things like that, they were, they were uh, a household name in electronics. I don't know if that had something to do with it as well, but... When the PlayStation came out, it just did very much seem like the Saturn in the West just did not exist. And that was media-wise and at retail. So, yeah, it did very much change overnight in that. And it's a show we're going to do later on as well, as you know, being a Saturn owner in the 90s is something we want to kind of talk about as well and go into that in more detail. But, yeah, you did feel 
kind of having a start at that time, you did feel the kind of seismic shift towards it in the UK, especially. Don't know how it was in America, I've not lived there, not been part of that kind of market, but over here, you definitely felt that PlayStation was taking a grip very early on. Yeah, the, the hype behind it was unreal. And again, how much of that was, you know, built just through people seeing the games and how much of it was through the media or maybe through retail in them hyping up the PlayStation 1. I don't think we'll ever know for certain, but I don't think anyone, I don't think even Sony expected the success of the PlayStation, of, of the very first PlayStation, because it broke several records when it was launched in the US and in the UK. It eclipsed the Saturn's lead that had been building up for, for months, uh, pretty much overnight uh, with pre-orders. And again, that's the Saturn had trouble still getting the consoles into people's hands, still trouble getting consoles into store shelves. I mean, part of me thinks that that early launch, you kind of see the rationale behind it. When you look at stuff like PlayStation 5 right now or Nintendo's mini consoles in the past where people have, you know, eagerly anticipated them and been paying silly money for them. You know, PlayStation sitting in, in CEXs for like £700 not too long ago, you know, Maybe if things were slightly different, maybe that's what Sega were aiming for. But the PlayStation was the the, the Sony brand was too strong, the recognition was too strong, and I think you know the media seemed to prefer Ridge Racer and Wipeout over Daytona, and even to Shinden and Tekken over Virtua Fighter. It was it was all uh, all happened very very quickly. I mean, even promotion of the Sam was sparse. I talked just now, mate, about the fact that I didn't even know it was out until I actually saw it running in a, in a, in a local shop. Uh, as I said, I used to read Sonic the Comic all the time, and they barely even mentioned the console. They used to do tie-in comics for all the Mega Drive games. There was a Golden Axe strip, a Streets of Rage strip, a Shinobi strip, a Wonder Boy strip, even like a Mutant League strip, but never anything for the Sega Saturn. Uh, I don't know why that it, was, that it wasn't so well, you know, marketed even the even the us ads were pretty obtuse and you know weird weren't they uh, <laughs> head for some i i oh i mean the the us promo video i mean you know you've got the the bald woman with the kind of saturn rings around her heads looking at you like she's going to eat you and then you've got the kind of kratos look alike you know with big purple heads the year is 1995 and it's like really kind of weird and then this mad stoner guy just wanders onto the screen and starts like giggling and, and talking about games and it's like it was just really really obscure like you know i don't know if they tried to kind of capture that kind of edgy kind of mega drive genesis style market again and they didn't quite manage to to hit the nail on the head i remember the uk advert that was very very rarely seen um you know, it's like, oh, does he design the games? No, he executes them. And then you get, like, you hear loud and he's, hi and all that in the background. And you see a wee bit of Panzer Dragoon locking on, but there's not a lot of gameplay. And then the driver is in the kind of Daytona car, and then the guy's playing it with a joystick, and it looks like an Amiga joystick. Um, and his eyeballs get sucked out, and he's basically taking control, and he crashes the car. And, you know, reality always hurts, that kind of thing. And it's, you know, welcome to the real world, Sega Saturn. But it, it wasn't common. And that's the thing, you're talking about, you know, promotion of the Saturn being really sparse. You you knew the PlayStation was coming. You know, you couldn't miss it um, in terms of, like again, like gaming programs pushing it. Both Games Master and Bad Influence gaming magazines pushing it, you know, the CVG, things like that. You knew it was coming. You know, Wipeout was hyped. Tekken was hyped. Ridge Racer was really, really hyped. Um, and again, it was, it was bizarre that, you know, someone like you who... You did have your ear close to the ground, you were, you know, Master System, Mega Drive, you know, Sonic 2 is your favourite game, you know, you've had all these consoles before, I, I mean, Saturn's my first, my first proper Sega console, but you had no idea this was coming, but you couldn't avoid the hype for the PlayStation, you knew it was coming, um, and it's just kind of bizarre that, again, the adverts didn't show a great deal of in-depth gameplay, um, and again, try to kind of focus on the fact that they were bringing these arcade ports home, big hitters. They just didn't really show enough of it. Whereas Sony were trying to go down the kind of lifestyle kind of route. I'm pretty sure I've seen a clip, and I can't remember where I've seen it, but there was PlayStation pods and nightclubs in London. Yeah, there Dude, was. 
they had yeah. that until uh, and i only re recently found out from jason madison he was uh showing an article about it they had they had playstations in so many nightclubs i think yeah. it was about 50 nightclubs maybe maybe more right. than that there and they go. had them in there for uh, from nine early 95 to to 98 uh, it was a massive in you know they knew their demographic and their yeah. their marketing was <laughs> it was on point uh, as you'd expect from from sony you know this is a this is a company who gave us the Walkman, the Discman. This is a company that's now putting Spider-Man back into cinemas with 11 extra minutes to make people go and watch it again. So they, no uh, chance. They, they, Seriously? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Spider-Man, no way home. Uh, and my son's like, I'm going to watch it. I'm like, oh my God, you've already watched it twice in the cinema and again on sky why you going to watch it again this is exactly why they're doing it so that 11 minutes of nonsense just to get another, another oh, little so, show, yeah. and then and then you'll get the blu-ray and dvd no way home uncut a director's cut yes the so. director's cut aye that'll be out jeez aye one thing you can never accuse sony of being as bad at marketing um they they know what they're doing unfortunately for for sega yeah so i think by contrast, the Saturn marketing was it was odd, obscure, obtuse, and just n not very present in the public image, in the public like, mind. So they were losing out early there. And as we already discussed, mate, the price, you know, that played into the consciousness because, as I say, we said the Saturn was $100 more expensive for the base unit. Obviously, we talked about bundling the game in the internal culture, but again, that plays into that whole that whole media is managed but into the hands of the market side for Sony. But I mean, Sega actually reduced the cost of the Saturn in the U S by a hundred dollars. I think a month after the PlayStation came out just to try and gain some ground. The problem was that the Saturn at that point was being sold at a loss due to how expensive it was to manufacture. And that obviously hindered their ability to, to be competitive on price. Um, and unlike Sony, they were having to, buy their cd lenses all their chips and everything were being ex uh, created by external companies yeah i mean again it goes back to that that interview you and i spoke about as well um you know and it's, it was ken kutaragi and um, was, was speaking to to hideki sato um and basically you know just said you know hideki chan there's no way you can beat me where are you buying your processors from from hitachi from yamaha what about your cd rom drives you're buying everything you by buying from hitachi hitachi is profiting you know you can't make anything yourselves we can make everything ourselves including custom parts we have our own factories you know so straight away you know you're, you're seeing the advantage that sony had by just being an electronics company by nature you know so um other comments you know kutaragi said to hideki sato is you know so just quit the hardware business why not just do software so this was already you know sony who were a newcomer to gaming had the actual cheek and audacity to turn around to hideki sato the man who had created sega systems you know and saying just you know just do just do software um but he says here again uh, kutaragi saying we'll give you favorable treatment you know um and, and and sato is saying you know he wanted us to go third party we've been going for so long in the hardware business for better or worse um and now he wants us to go third party we had been half-heartedly successful in america once and this made it impossible to quit the hardware business maybe if the mega drive or the genesis had been a failure in the west things would have been different but we had a strange taste of success so that can even though it was a failure in japan the mega drive the western success kind of buoyed on the japanese division to kind of go again but there's again you know ken kutaragi the father of playstation maybe his first console out a year and he's trying to tell hideki sato to <laughs> tell sega to chuck it it's a hideki sato who's created at least five consoles <laughs> himself <laughs> who's designed those five consoles you know it's absolutely the, as you say mate the barefaced cheek of it but yeah he, that just kind of underlines sega's problems in that their outgoings from creating the sega saturn which because of its co the complexity of its architecture was already an expensive uh, piece of hardware for them to develop is always going to be more expensive to to, to maintain and to uh, to produce than than the PlayStation, not only because the PlayStation is a more streamlined piece of kit, but because Sony can manufacture many of those pieces by themselves. I mean, we know that they make CD 
audio systems uh, before then. You know, they created systems like the the mini disc, etc. But the fact that they were also creating silicone way before that. I mean, King Kutaragi's first kind of dipping his toe in the water was uh, creating the sound chip for the Super Nintendo. So yeah, they 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 had all the tools to really be competitive, and uh, it's frightening to see how much you know. Again, with hindsight, how much people underestimated them. Yeah. I mean, Sony as well are very clever in that. From experience in the market, they knew that, again, like Sega were trying to go premium, you know, and trying to kind of give you everything for the price out the box. But that higher entry level put people off. But Sony cleverly know that if you throw in a cheap AV cable, people with higher end technology have money to burn. So they'll go out and buy the better cables. So that's again bringing you more money in. So Sega didn't quite understand the kind of the marketing aspect of it, whereas Sony were very, very savvy. They gave you everything at an entry level price point, which, you know, to be fair, up to I don't think the PlayStation 3 even come with an HDMI cable. You know, I don't think it did. I think it was only Xbox 360 came with HD component cables and then the Elite later on came with an HDMI, but you know, they know that they get you in at a low price and then they know that what they give you is good enough for the average consumer, but the higher end customer that wants the premium experience will go out and buy the cables that they need. That they need. So Sega didn't quite grasp that. They were trying to give everything out of the box. One go, look, brilliant, boom, 400 quid, whereas Sony weren't. And then the fact that, as you said, they make everything. They're an electronics company. They've got factories. They've got distribution. They make lenses for for CD players. For you know, obviously they now make it for the like DVD and Blu-ray and things like that. And that trends kind of continue through to this day that they can man they manufacture electronics. It's what they do. So they had that advantage. So what Kutaragi was saying was correct in a way, you know, because everything Sega's putting into the Saturn to try and sell to make money, they're having to buy these parts off other companies, whereas Sony could just literally walk in and just pick them off their own factory shelf. Yeah, it's so true, mate. But, uh, I mean, talking about big purchases, uh, another one would be very important uh, in the Saturn versus PlayStation console war, and that is the purchase of uh, Signosis by, by Sony, because... We've already touched on the fact that the Sega Saturn launched in the US with only six games. In the UK, it only had four of those games were localised in time for the power launch. And we saw them slowly trickle through, um, which was a, a real shame. And I think that harmed some of, the, again, the consumer confidence in the Sega Saturn that these games weren't coming through quick enough. Uh, and part of that was because, as we've talked about before, the Sega Saturn was quite difficult. To, to develop for and that wasn't helped by the fact that most of the games that were developed in the west uh were put on these they didn't even get development kits on the sega saturn until kind of early 94 in fact mid 94 i think in a lot of cases and even they came out with you know manuals that were poorly translated i think in the terms of it for maxis who made SimCity 2000 according to pandemonium's video they they the manual they had didn't wasn't translated at all and they were lucky that they had a japanese speaker on the team that could uh, that could translate it uh sony on the other hand uh they the purchase of Signosis was really driven by the sn systems who uh, created a lot of the tools for the for the playstation so that gave the playstation a really robust and easy to use set of development tools which made the Saturn seem even more even more challenging. Yeah, I mean again going back to you look at Pandemonium's um Virtua Cop documentary uh, and his Virtua Racing one as well and you see the size of the in fact the Virtua Racing one they, they talk to the developers in that um for Virtua Racing and they actually show you the size of the, the Saturn development kit. It's, it was a a giant piece of kit and then you look at what SN Systems made because it's quite funny like you can tell that Sony didn't buy Signosis for their games because the games went multi-platform. You know, the, the Crown Jewel Wipeout came to Saturn. You know, um, Wipeout 297 came to Saturn. So they, they didn't buy them. Obviously, Wipeout had an impact at launch, the cultural kind of aspect of it, the music as we've talked about. But they didn't, they didn't buy them just to keep their games and keep them exclusive. They wanted SN Systems. They wanted those 
custom development kits that would literally enable them to to be very very easy to make games for whereas as you say sega were sending out you know development kits that looked like you know beige pc towers clipped together um and they had manuals that weren't in english and then obviously we've looked at the virtua cop documentary that pandemonium did and you know um the, the sega graphics library that yu suzuki was obviously trying to put together um to make things easier make make it a better development process for for saturn and allow developers to kind of go in and, and utilize you know the the, the the two cpu cores on there get into vdp one and two and, and make them kind of try and work together a bit better um but i just sn systems was the kind of trojan horse that's what they wanted they didn't actually want Psygnosis for just their games. They wanted SN systems in there, um, and it gave them a heads up. You know that that combination of that ease of being able to access parts, manufacture, you know, distribution, all that kind of aspect. Then they've got SN systems making these development kits that made it an absolute doddle for developers to do far better looking games at the time, 3D wise, um, in terms of what it was throwing around frame rates and things like that than what the Saturn was doing at that same point. Unfortunately, you talk about the launch period. Obviously, as we went further on in the Sega graphics library, was used mainly by Sega, Virtua Cop, Sega Rally, um, you know, Virtua Fighter 2, Panzer Dragoon's Vi, things like that, that would really show what the system could do. But, um, yeah, just crazy to think that, you know, the, the late finalised silicon, the, the absence of dev kits, and then the complexity of the dev kits all combined in that kind of first initial period to make the Saturn just seem an absolute nightmare to develop for. You know, the Virtua Racing documentary, as well as we mentioned um, by Pandemonium, that Sega didn't even give Time Warner um, a source code for Virtua Racing. They gave them an arcade machine and told them to replicate it. Yeah. That sounds you know, an, it sounds an awful lot like uh, these stories that you hear from the from the eight bit uh, Microsoft era when some you know when coders are making ports of Final Fight for the Spectrum and Amiga and the Commodore sixty four. <laughs> they weren't given any source code or anything. They basically bought the license from Capcom, and Capcom said, "All right, thanks. Okay, go and make your port then." And they didn't. They weren't provide any source code or anything. They just uh, they just had to copy the arcade machine. I think I can't remember what game it was. It might have been Golden Axe or something, where they they basically didn't own the arcade machine. They had to keep going to the arcade, oh, man. copying the sprites and going back and doing it from memory, which is insane. I oh. can't remember what game it was. It might have been Golden Axe, but the fact that Sega themselves have you know licensed this out to Time Warner as an as an exclusive to try and get software onto their Sega Saturn and couldn't give them the, the source code is is kind of beyond tragic really so it's a it's a real shame uh just again shows the sort of poor decision making i guess from sega during that period and it all the the I don't think it's one thing. It's a lot. Of it's, it feels like death by a thousand cuts in this early in these early exchanges with uh, with Sony, where it's it just seems one silly idea after another. And even though you know the games, you know when they did arrive were were, were fantastic. Uh, even those early launch titles got a lot of love for those early launch titles. Um, it just didn't. It was just you know things kind of eroded developer trust, retail trust, consumer trust. Um, and as the as the you know the year wore on, that's where Sega found themselves uh, trying to trying to catch up, catch up to the PlayStation, which they launched four months before. Yeah, and I mean just kind of getting back to that that Virtua uh, you know racing documentary, as well that you know the the developers for that they also recognised that they had to put extra content in there, which is why the Saturn Virtua racing has got. You know the grand prix mode and it's got a ton of extra tracks on there as well they kind of identified that people were looking for more than just a bare bones arcade port but the words that they the developer used in that was that the reason why sega didn't do the port themselves is they were too busy <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> no, no shit. With six consoles to support, I mean, they were still releasing Master System and Mega CD games in '95. It's just, oh, I can't believe you know it, it. It the writing was on the wall. Really, it's just a shame that no one at Sega at the time could notice what what was happening. I mean, they did seem to clock on to the fact that developers were struggling with the Sega Saturn, and uh, as time wore on, that was why the Sega graphics library was uh, being developed by teams within Sega to try and improve the uh, the usability of, of the Sega Saturn. 
Yeah, and kind of going back as well to a, a chat we were having on Twitter actually earlier today as well, kind of talking about Tomb Raider, um, and you'd mentioned it was in one of um, John Linneman's videos, um, maybe in a DF Retro video, but it was something that said that Tomb Raider on the Saturn was done primarily on VDP-1. They didn't use VDP-2. Now, there was kind of caveats to that as to the kind of the, the movement of the camera and the angle of the kind of camera behind the character and the way that it was drawn and things like that, that it meant VDP-2 wouldn't have had much of an impact. But you would think that, you know, if you look at, you know, the fact that VDP-2 was drawn, you know, the, the sky and the ground, they could have taken some of the load off of VDP-1 and apparently, again, some of the, the actual, what we were seeing on screen, was being drawn off screen, so the gamer was never actually seeing what VDP one was actually doing. So that and its a kind of effect would have been that it was actually slowing the game down because it was, you know, resources being used to draw assets that the, the player was never seeing. They were off screen. So, you know, again, maybe that could have been a better port as well if they if the the, the dev kits have been better, if they could have utilized VDP one and two to some extent to make it a bit better. Um, and obviously, as time would go on, we would see that, you know, Sony would pay, you know, Core to, to keep Tomb Raider 2 off the Saturn. But another chat we were having, I think it was Videopolis as well on Twitter, was saying that the biggest hint that Tomb Raider, because he was saying he was having a debate with somebody that um, they were saying, oh, the Saturn couldn't do Tomb Raider 2. And he was saying, well, whenever the game was made, it was drawn in quads. So the fact the game was being designed around the very polygon shape that the Saturn uses suggests that it might even be coming to Saturn first before Sony paid core to, to keep it off. So it's not that the Saturn couldn't do Tomb Raider 2. It was well underway, but it was just Sony were starting to flex their muscles and obviously kind of try to keep, um, you know, games off, off of, of the Saturn. But I, it would just be really interesting to see if that development kind of environment had been more mature, if they'd maybe got the Sega Graphics Library in place before launch to let it roll out and give developers a better chance to kind of utilise it and learn it, then we could have seen some better games as a result. Quite possibly, mate. I mean, Tomb Raider started its development back in 1994, um, late 1994, of course, but Tomb Raider, Toby Guard was influenced actually by, <laughs> by Virtual Fighter, you know, to bring everything full circle. Um, maybe that's why she's rendered in quads as well. But... Um, if that if it started developing in 1994 then they probably were working with these huge bulky uh development machines and they they wouldn't have had time between using you know between the launch date of tomb raid which was what just 10 10 months after uh, 10 months into 1996 um to start utilizing sgl from the ground up so yeah but sgl that was first um that was first premiered in the virtual fighter 2 demo um, that was shown around uh, around E3 as well, and shown in the summer, and that really started to give a hint of of the sort of progress that that Sega were making. And I think a lot was being made of the of the port of Virtual Fire Two and of of Virtual Fire Cop, especially the fact that they're being powered by these new tools. Yeah, I mean, again, um, in that documentary, the the Virtual Cop documentary, they actually show you um, the. The tech demo of, of Lau and, and Pai walking about the stage and you actually see I think it's like a Japanese game show like a video game show and you actually see that the, the, the wee guy sits falling and he's blown away by what he's in the subtitles I'm sure it says that this is on a Saturn they've got this running on a Saturn they, they were completely blown away by it and rightly so because as we've just said you know we've said many times on this show as well you know for me and, and probably for yourself as well I think you know Virtua Fighter 2 stands alone is the single greatest technological achievement of that generation that the Saturn should not be running that game that good, you know, high resolution mode, sixty FPS, you know, it's an absolute marvel that it's running it, um, and a real testament to just how powerful the SGL was and how how it really did allow Sega, especially who knew it best, to get the absolute you know best out of the Saturn. Absolutely. Um... And it really just showcased how excited people were in Japan for it. Because, yeah, that, that same episode, they're saying, <laughs> well, this is arcade perfect. And we're looking at this early footage. We can, <laughs> we can tell with our, with our, with our mature eyes, <laughs> 20, 26 years or 27 years later, that, that it's not arcade perfect. But back then, 
Um, and it's like I thought like, Virtua Cup Fighters, who was arcade perfect when that came to the Sega Saturn when I first played it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's only when you you know you get more used to these things that you can tell. But there was a lot of excitement around Virtua Fighter Two and Virtua Virtua Cop. Uh, Virtua Cop actually just about made it into the into the Saturn Year One library for <laughs> for uh, in the UK. <laughs> Oh, I mean, that's the thing as well, I remember, um, was the bootleg sampler demo disc, you know, that had a, a playable demo of, of Sega Rally, and it was only one track in the, the two cars, it was like a kind of practice run um, on, on Forest Stage, but to my eyes at that time, looking at that, it was mind-blowing, it was like, it, it looked arcade perfect to me, you know, at that point in time, obviously now we know it's not, um, but... You know, Virtua Fighter 2 and Sega Rally and obviously Virtua Cop as well, the, the big three as they're commonly, you know, referred to, they really did build up a lot of kind of hype. Again, especially in Japan, Virtua Fighter 2, in the West arcades, as we said, were dying to death. You know, people were kind of getting more used to the, the extra content that games in the home were giving them now. Um, they were getting 3D graphics at home, so the arcade kind of lost a bit of allure. But in Japan, you know, Virtua Fighter, and even today, you know, Virtua Fighter still, there was that um, trailer that came out for, what was it, the, the Virtua Fighter eSports game, and it was just Akira with his back to the camera, and it was his silhouette, an open kind of door with sunlight coming through, and that, that alone drove hype mental, people thought, oh, it's Virtua Fighter 6, and it turned out that it wasn't, but, you know, Virtua Fighter 2, a phenom, again, just in Japan, and that really did drive a lot of interest, whereas over here, again, it was more the kind of hardcore Sega element, the arcade cores who were more interested in it, whereas in Japan, it was, again, just a cultural phenomenon. Yeah, it, it really was. Um, in Japan, they were they were almost ravenous for um, for those for those ports. I mean, in Japan, the Saturn had actually passed two, two million co- uh, consoles sold um, before the end of the year. Uh, a lot of that driven by uh, the, the big three in Japan, which all did actually launch in Japan that year. Um, Virtua Fighter 2 going on to be an absolute smash hit. Virtua Cop actually making its way over to, to the West fairly early, uh, as, as per Pandemonium's documentary, actually creeped over uh, very early in 1994 uh, into, into stores in the US, where it was um, actually uh, being sold without the gun in many cases uh but the gun was was pivotal to, to to the game itself uh, and was proven to be exceptionally popular as well um it was i think that was the closest to uh, kind of arcade perfect people had seen especially for a model 2 cabinet at that for a model 2 port at that time which was uh which was, really does seem to start a started to look like a turning point for the sake of saturn at the time because of how good that virtual virtual cop port was I, I mean, the big three, whenever they came out, um, as I say, I mean, I remember that was the one thing about whenever they did come out is that obviously um, I'd got Virtua Fighter 2 and, and Sega Rally in successive weeks because my uncle had completely forgot he'd bought one of them. I can't remember what one he bought first. It was in early 96, but he forgot he bought one the week before and bought the, the other one the following week. But these were on the bottom shelf in Beaties, you know, and they were new games. You know, so even again, you're talking about that kind of analysis as kind of kind of following year, we want to kind of kind of bring it back, but um, that kind of retail bias that we were starting to see that you know, games as big as that they were huge in Japan and they were coming over here and they were going on the bottom shelf and and stores, high street stores, which was quite kind of baffling. Um, but they did definitely show you know what, what the Saturn was capable of, and you at that point you're seeing the reviews coming in and you're thinking, right, that's if the tide's going to turn now, people can see. You know what it's capable of. People must want these in the home. These are going to start flying off the shelves. And unfortunately, you know, if you look at the the US sales, um, four hundred thousand Saturn sold versus eight hundred thousand PS ones. Sega were very very quickly losing market share in the West. They were. The tide was turning very quickly. The the the. Sega Genesis was actually losing ground to the Super Nintendo at the time. Nintendo obviously didn't have a uh, have a, a, a 64-bit or 32-bit console on the market at that time, so all their eggs went into the Super Nintendo basket, and they were they were going from strength to strength with uh, Donkey Kong Country 2 and games like um, I think Super Mario RPG was 1995 as well. So there, it was the SNES was facing fighting having a comeback against Mega Drive. But meanwhile, 
Sega's market share is uh, getting sh shrunk as well by the fact that the Sega Saturn is really struggling against the PlayStation One, and uh, a lot of a lot of hope really went into the Big Three and to into FGO at the time. Virtual Cop came out uh, and was very well received. Uh, came out in uh, mid November for the Saturn. Uh, leaked a little bit early in some in some areas, but uh, that came out and was quite successful. Um, but the uh, but Sega Rally uh, was kind of rushed to market in uh, North America to come out to come out that year. Sega Rally actually, you know, if you play all three ports, it's it's, it's arguably the uh, the worst version, the original uh, North American version. And then Virtua Fighter Two also coming out right at the very tail end of the year in in the US. Obviously, it came out in uh in japan uh just in time for the for the holiday market um but it left sega in a very precarious position yeah i mean obviously the, the focus that they did put on the big three um you know you, you're looking at that and you're thinking again why not hold off the launch you know uh, it goes back to that whole point about if they had waited and and kind of and i know hindsight's a great thing and, and you're looking at it and going right they would have given sony a big head start with all that hype we talked about with all that kind of you know cultural kind of the, the club and the, the, the kind of club scene and get the you know the the kind of rave kind of the, the dance music kind of aspect of wipe out things and perhaps they felt that it would have been insurmountable at that point in time to try and catch sony um if they had kind of waited but the quality of the software that was coming just six months after launch it was night and day so again it's just one of those things where at that point you would think sega were looking at it and going right we've got these three games out they're absolute you know arcade perfect ports they're brilliant surely people are going to start picking the system up and unfortunately it just did not happen it didn't in that in that first year mate uh, i mean by the time we got to the end of the year uh as we say two million sales in Japan and it was easily outselling the PlayStation at the time um, not by a significant amount but it always remained just ahead as we said it, in in the UK uh, it had only sold uh, around 35 uh, sorry 25,000 Saturns uh, against 35,000 PlayStation 1 so not a massive difference in there um both of those consoles at the time they were they'd been affected by hardware shortages quite an interesting <laughs> quite an interesting uh little tidbit from uh from the u.s market was that the playstation was selling so well that they couldn't manufacture enough game cases so they had to <laughs> they had to they had to purchase game cases from sega so that's why in the u.s uh there's a certain number of uh titles that came out on the playstation one during a certain window in 1995 that were actually in the great big clear sega saturn style boxes rather than the typical uh even the place even the standard playstation on boxes they're different to all of those <laughs> um, what the hell yeah which is crazy to when you come to think of it yeah i mean again it's just it's a contrast in fortunes you look at you know you're talking about that, that two million console sold in japan compared to the kind of meager numbers over in the west even allowing for the kind of stock shortages um the, the attitudes as you're going towards the end of 1995 they could not be more you know f you know more further apart you know in japan the console's flying it's ahead of sony albeit only a little bit we all know what happens in 1997 whenever a certain game comes out and we'll get to that in due course don't worry um that's two more episodes down the line of the saturn years but um for whatever reason you know th that that kind of perfect storm of the kind of the rush launch the developers being kind of left out the loop missing the launch period games not being finished development kits being overly complex the sgl not being completed in time it just led to a complete malaise in in the west for the system whereas in japan the appetite for it was brilliant you know coupled by the fact that the software library in in japan is is infinitely superior to what we got over here and again as we go through the kind of later years and we start to kind of compare and contrast some of the kind of titles that didn't make it over we did do a previous episode where you and i picked six titles each that didn't even leave japan um and that's only touching the surface we could do another two or three of those episodes and pick another six each easily um such was the, the breadth and depth of quality software that only stayed in japan but it's crazy to see one system have such 
absolutely contrasting fortunes. The, the, the Japanese were very much on board with it. What they were being fed on the Saturn was very much tailored to them and they were they were very happy with it. But Western developers were looking to do different things and they just felt that that development environment didn't support them in doing that. Coupled with the rush launch, it just basically it, it turned them off. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. And when you watch the uh, when you watch Pandemonium's uh, Virtual Cop um, documentary, how the developers are all basically novices that will come in and report in this high profile arcade game, and they <laughs> they just all seem to kind of get stuck in, and uh, they're they're like, well, we didn't have much, and we didn't know the struggles, blah blah blah, but we just kind of got on with it. So I don't know if it was a difference in in, in mentality or, or what it was, but uh, it did seem that. Western developers more were more sensitive, at least, to, to how the Saturn was, you know, engineered and how we, that the, the development kits were. Um, and it's it's a crying shame because that third party support really was was dwindling. I mean, sat they you know, Saturn and, uh, and PlayStation are they're obviously rivals and they're obviously always going to be paired off together. But you know, realistically, thematically, and internally, technically, they they couldn't be more different. You've got the Sega Saturn which uh, is completely, you know, 90% first party based really, especially in this opening year. Most games are published or developed by Sega, um, even down to how, how it performs, you know, it maps sprites to polygons for textures rather than, you know, actually texture mapping itself. Whereas the PlayStation is the inverse of that, where all, almost all of its, uh, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure that all of its initial lineup was uh, was externally developed. They didn't have any first party content, and that wasn't capable of two D sprites. So Sony mandated that they could, weren't allowed to do two D games, uh, and if anyone did, they had to basically turn polygons into sprites. So <laughs> the two the two couldn't be any <laughs> any more different. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, I mean, the the, the Virtua Cop stuff you just kind of touched on there as well the fact that the, the development team were complete novices had been in, in the door at Sega a very very short period of time one of them hadn't even programmed anything before one guy had never been a planner before um, and they just basically got to it and they were sitting there with the, the hopes of, of the Saturn on their shoulders because this was the first game using the SGL you know um, and, and they had to show what the Saturn could do and some of the kind of tricks and tips that they were showing that, that they worked out, you know, again using VDP 1 and 2 where the, the bit that really got to me that I, th I thought was amazing and you don't even notice it is that um, in, in the third stage whenever you kind of obviously, you know yourself, you, you start outside the office block you kind of maps up, you look up out of the sky and you see the skyscraper, you come down you take out some kind of enemies in the kind of wee security kind of gate hut at the start, it goes along a brown wall, some kind of soldiers jump up you take them out and then the camera pans along to the left and then goes down into a kind of underground parking lot and they were saying that if they were using VDP2 to draw the ground as you went down into the parking lot the camera would pan up so that ground that they were drawing with VDP2 would continue to go up so they basically had to draw a polygon of the same texture with the VDP1 that at that point where the camera comes along and goes down into the parking lot, that the polygon from VDP1 mapped across and went on top of the part of VDP2 that was drawn it. And they actually, to the eye, you don't see them merging, but it was a kind of very clever trick to hide the fact that they were drawing the ground with VDP2 and bringing that, that polygon across. And I thought, that's absolutely insane that these guys were complete novices and they managed to come up with all these kind of tricks and tips to kind of do these kind of different things with the Saturn because you see them constantly referring to it as a sprite machine which I thought was interesting you know you know we, we were doing 3D on, a, on what is essentially a sprite machine um, and again I just absolutely unbelievable the kind of tricks and tips that these guys were doing as complete novices in their first major project at Sega um, and then Western developers were having a a moan um, about what they could and couldn't do. So it does put it in some kind of context when I mean, you think of it that way, that these complete rookies turned out such an amazing Model 2 port of Virtua, via Virtua Cop, and yet over here it was very much, you know, complaints about the development environment. It really was, mate. Just goes to show how, how important SGL was. So there we go. I think we've made it to the end of the year. So, I mean, if we just sub, I just run through the list of games that we had, 
Virtua Fighter Victory Gold, they, and this is the UK, sorry, this is the UK list of games, not the US one. So we had Virtua Fighter Victory Gold, Daytona USA and Clockwork Knight all at launch. And then following over the months, Pebble Beach Golf, Pan's Lagoon, those two both being US launch titles, I believe. And then Myst, Digital Pinball, Street Fighter the Movie, Shinobi X, Bug, Virtua Fighter Remix, Clockwork Night, Theme Park, Mansion of Hidden Souls, Out by October, NHS Holstar Hockey, Offworld Interceptor, Extreme, Parodius, Rayman, Robotica, Virtual Racing, World Series Baseball, all out in November, then Victory Boxing, Cyber Speedway, FIFA 96, Golden Axe June, High Octane, Worms, Thunderhawk 2, Virtual Cop, and Virtual Highlight, and SimCity, all in December. So, how's that lineup sound to you, mate? There's plenty there. Um, but again, you look at the kind of third party support, the only kind of ones that really jump out, you're looking at FIFA 96, um, looking at Rayman, um, Street Fighter the movie, less said the better. Um, I like but... Street Fighter the movie. I'm a Street Fighter the movie oh, apologist. <laughs> oh, mate, honestly. As I think about that as well, my pal copy of that, I think if they all did, came in one of those big American style boxes as well. Oh, did it? Yeah, yeah, it was a big, big, giant plastic case. Um, Thunderhawk 2 is a name that jumps out. You know, I, I got that in my bundle when I got my, my own Saturn. That's a um, class game, it? Christmas 96, and yeah, that was a, a great game. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're, you're seeing that a lot of first-party stuff in there, some trickles through of, you know, third-party stuff, but you're not seeing anything kind of close to the sort of quality third-party-wise that you were seeing on, on PlayStation. And I think... That kind of sums up. You look at that there, the kind of the Western development environment, um, you know, compared to obviously the kind of first party output from Sega, who were very in tune with the hardware. Um, it's interesting about Panzer Dragoon because, oh, yeah, it was a US launch title, but there's kind of an argument, and I think it was Classic Gaming Quarterly had said this, is that he believes that Panzer Dragoon should have been the pack in game. I don't know what your kind of take on that is. Do you think, again, retrospectively looking at it, had Sega been more in tune with what Western gamers were looking for, moving away from that arcade kind of focus, that Panzer Dragoon certainly as a showpiece, I think, would have certainly, you know, maybe shown off the Saturn a lot more than what Virtua Fighter did, as impressive a port as it was. Um, Obviously, it didn't come out here until August, but had they stuck to the September Saturn Day launch as intended, then it could have been the launch title and been a pack-in game. So what, what's your kind of take on the Panzer Dragoon versus Virtua Fighter? Yeah, it's an interesting one um, because Panzer Dragoon didn't quite have the name recognition that Virtua Fighter did. Obviously, Virtua Fighter was the, wasn't the was as big over in the West as it was in, in Japan, but I was still, I was still heavily into the Virtua Fighter brand. I really wanted to play Virtua Fighter in the home. I'd played it fleetingly in the in the arcade. I actually played the sequel by this point. And it it, it was, you know, one of the most wanted games. I either wanted a 32X to get a port of it and or I wanted to get, you know, a Sega Mega Drive port of it using the Sega Virtual Processor like Virtual Racing. However that they I was going to get it, that's what I wanted. And it was a key driver behind me getting a Saturn in the first place. But I think if you're trying to, to draw in the public, especially in, you know, the masses weren't massively into Virtual Fighter, then Panzer Dragoon is the better showpiece. It's the, it's the game that, you know, Virtua Fire wasn't showpiece for the Saturn. Maybe Virtua Fire Remix a little bit. But if you want to show what the Sega Saturn can do, then, yeah, Panzer Dragoon is is kind of what you want to, want to go with. Uh, I think it's probably more impressive than Wipeout or... Uh, Ridge Racer at the time, um, the, given the large environment's the ability to rotate the camera around, um, a lot more interesting maybe, but uh, not quite as flashy, and it didn't have the Prodigy playing in the background either. So uh, <laughs> you could argue maybe the Saturn shouldn't have had a packing game. Maybe PlayStation did it right in that they just let the consumer buy whatever game it was on, on the side of it, but. Uh, I think Sega traditionally, especially with the success that they had with Sonic and bundling that with Mega Drives and Genesis, is they were the packing game. And Virtua Fighter, I think, more than Panzer Dragoon had the name recognition, even if it wasn't the graphical showpiece. Yeah, that's a good point, by the way. The fact that, again, that was Tom that went to Sega of Japan and says, look, yeah, we're going to drop the price and we're going to throw our best game in for free. Yeah. Um, and obviously there was the, the, the fact that, you know, Nakayama kicked his seat over and, you know, <laughs> glared at Tom and then eventually as he walked out the door, he turned around and says, do it, you know, 
put you in to to raise the, the brand in, in the West. So you've got my backing to do it. And perhaps that probably did play a large part. And again, thinking about, you know, a pack-in game. Whereas again, yep, Sony, as we've said, very clever, put out the bare bones. You know, you've got to recoup your costs through software. And by Sega putting a game in there, a major game, they weren't giving themselves the opportunity to kind of have the consumer pick up a 50 quid game along with the system. Yeah, two massive points there, mate. I mean, the first one is the fact that I never thought of it this way, but, you know, as crazy as everyone went in Japan when Tom Kalinske went over there and said, look, let's bundle our best game with the console. I said, oh, you can't do that. You're insane. You can't do that. Only for them, you know, three years later in Japan to bundle their best game with the Sega Saturn to massive success. <laughs> uh, the irony is not lost on me there. Uh, but the other thing is the fact that they're bundling games in with the console uh, to the detriment of their bottom line is something that may happen in the future but um we'll have to tune in for uh the saturn year 2 1996 to, to see what happens <laughs> there but mate I've had a, an absolute blast as always with this one so there we have it in japan the saturn's flying two million consoles sold uh versus just over one and a half million playstations you know they're winning over there in the us the playstation's outselling the saturn two to one in europe it's a little bit closer but the playstation is still win still winning the big three have launched to japan they're doing amazingly they've only just come out in america they're due to come out in 1996 for the for the for power users for the sega saturn can that reverse the console's fortunes in the west i think everyone knows the answers but i'm going to enjoy going through the story next next time we do this mate <laughs> I'll be brilliant. I mean, this is, again, we thought it was going to be a two-hour show. We're just shy of that. Um, it's going to fill a majority of our slot on uh, Radio Sega. So you might have time to get one or two requests in if you're listening on Radio Sega at the time. Um, I highly recommend Flight in the Dark from Squid Race, Akira's um, theme from Virtua Fighter, uh, and a wee bit of So High from Sega Touring Car if you're looking for some requests. <laughs> um, but no, uh, it's going to be great. I I've thoroughly enjoyed this, mate. It's, it's a great series. It's good to kind of go through and, and kind of relive things as well. The next episode is going to be us reviewing the launch titles to kind of tie in with this. And then we will be back in due course uh, with the Saturn years, year two, 1996. And this is where um, the battle heats up and where things start to change a wee bit. And here comes a new challenger. What does it all mean? Join us next time. You can catch me at Super underscore D. You can catch James at the Sega Holic. You can catch us both at Sega Guys. Until next time, stay retro, stay Sega. We will see you on the Sega side. Sega! <laughs> <laughs>